Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Clifford Muse. I'm the Associate Director of the Moreland Spingarn Research Center and the Howard University Archivist. Uh, on behalf of the Director of the Moreland Spingarn Research Center and the Howard University Libraries, Professor Rhea Ballard Thrower, I want to welcome you to this special program today. Uh, the program entitled Undisputed Dignity Preserving Black Women's History and Material Culture, a Symposium. Uh, Moreland Spingarn, as you all know, is one of the world's leading uh, repositories for collecting records on uh, black history and African culture. Uh, our manuscript division has over 650 collections. Approximately 70 of these collections relate to black women's history. So we're very pleased to be a co-sponsor of the program today. One of the guides that you can find on the Moreland Spingarn webpage is a guide to resources on women. It's dated and we need to update it, but you can look in, and see some of the collections that we've already uh, processed and you can get, see a description of these collections. Uh, because of our extensive holdings, we are honored to have this extraordinary panel today of scholars, researchers, students, faculty members. Uh, I thought I had the honor to introduce them, but I see in the program Dr. Matthews would do that, so I will give him that honor. Uh, I do want to say thank you for coming out. I think you will find the panel discussion not only uh, stimulating, but very educational. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. My name is Lopez Matthews. I am the manager of the Digital Production Center here at the Howard University Libraries in the Moreland Spingarn Research Center. And the goal of the Digital Production Center is to digitize and highlight important pieces of the Moreland Spingarn Collection and research done here at Howard. And so I'm very excited to have the Anna Julia Cooper Collection digitized and with the support of Penn State University and the Anna Julia Cooper Society and Shirley Moody Turner. Thank you so much for your support of the project. And it was our first collaborative project with another institution and we're excited that everything worked well and that you can view the collection on our Digital Howard website, which is listed in your program, dh.howard.edu slash AJ Cooper. You can view the digitized collection there. And if you talk about the program, we have hashtags and our Twitter handles on the bottom of the program as well. Hashtag undisputed underscore dignity, hashtag AJC symposium, at Moreland HU and at Digital Cooper. So tag us, comment, because you know we need the support, because you know folks deal with these, you know we're in a data-driven world now where you have to show that people are engaging with you and that people are actually interested in what you're doing to keep the money flowing. So tag us, like us, comment, you know. Thank you so much. Look at the collection, because we get those statistics too. So I want to also introduce our esteemed panelists today. Uh, Dr. Shirley Moody Turner, who is the Associate Professor of English and African American Studies at Penn State and also runs the Anna Julia Cooper Society, who, of course, I mentioned, supported the digitization of the Anna Julia Cooper Collection. And then we will have Dr. Kenvi Phillips, a product of Howard University, who is a curator for race and ethnicity at the Radcliffe Institute at Harvard University. Dr. Elizabeth Clark Lewis, who is the director of the public history program here at Howard University. Bless you. <laughs> Dr. Gabrielle Foreman, who is the Ned B. Allen Professor of English and Professor of History and Black American Studies at the University of Delaware. And she is the director of the Colored Conventions Project. And she's going to be presenting with Ms. Brandy Locke, who is the graduate student and Colored Convention Fellow at the University of Delaware. And so we will move forward in that order. And so I would like to call up Dr. Shirley Moody Turner. Thank you. 
Um, this is really such an honor, and I am a little emotional. Um, this is, uh, I just want to take a minute to kind of appreciate um, where we're at and appreciate the work that has gone into this project and to appreciate, you know, the collections that are here, um, the collections that are below us, and, you know, the labor and the love um, that people have, have shown to make this happen. Um, in terms of my, my formal thank yous, I want to thank Howard University. Um, let me get this situated here. Okay. Um, I want to thank Howard University Libraries, Dr. Charles Muse, um, Ms. Joellen Elbashir, Lopez Matthews, McKinney Johnson, um, Adrena Eiffel. Can you wave so we can, there's Adrena, hi Adrena. Um, who, who really helped, you know, kind of get everything together, grease the wheels, made this happen. So thank you, Adrena. Um, I want to thank Penn State Libraries, especially Athena Jackson, who um, co-sponsored this event from her um, Huck Chair Endowment, uh, the Center for Humanities and Information, and I also want to welcome um, some of our special guests. We have Matthew Francis, is he here? From, um, from Penn State Libraries. Um, Jennifer Cervantes, is she here? From NEH, and our students from the University of Delaware. There we are. <laughs> and from Penn State, Okay, <laughs> and from Howard University. Okay, so we got. <laughs> um, and, and I want to also thank my my sister panelists for joining me um, in this event. That was supposed to be behind me the whole time, but here it is now. <laughs> so. In 1958, Anna Julia Cooper penned this letter to the Afro-American newspaper. It is a notice that she is contributing $279.65 to be deposited at interest to the National Savings and Trust Company in honor of her 100th birthday and for the future publication of her essay, The Ethics of the Negro Question and the Negro's Dialect. In the letter, Cooper, writing at 100 years old, asserts herself once again as the tenaciously active agent advocating for the publication of her writings and her words. With her characteristically meticulous hand straining to maintain a vestige of its former self, Cooper, across inconsistent line breaks and with tremulously drawn letters, reaches out to posterity in a final effort to steward into print her writings on race, gender, and culture. Despite her efforts, however, these essays lay dormant in the archives until 1998, when they were finally published by Charles Lemur and Ismay Bon in a voice of Anna Julia Cooper. In the last four decades, selections from Anna Julia Cooper's most well-known work, A Voice from the South by a Black Woman of the South, have been reprinted and anthologized in collections over three dozen times. The prevalence and accessibility of her work, however, belies the arduous history that characterized Cooper's attempts to secure a public voice in print. For instance, just two years after the publication of A Voice from the South, Cooper is said to have had, quote, another book on the way. However, we know virtually nothing about this second book, and instead it exists in Kevin Young's terms as a shadow book, part of the vast unwritten that threatens us all, the black literature denied existence. Thus, given the complex history of Cooper's publishing efforts, the 1958 letter is perhaps a more suitable emblem of her publishing career than are the dozens of discreetly circulating excerpts from her 1892 collection. In my brief comments today, I want to talk about what it is we learn by revisiting Cooper's larger archive, by reading the shadow books that haunt her published writings, and by finding new ways to recognize and read work we might have overlooked before. The first example I draw is from my own work on Cooper scrapbooks, specifically, and some of my students have heard this before, but that's okay, um, specifically <clears throat> her scrapbooks from, 18, from 1931 to 1940. The scrapbook contains dozens of articles, essays, notes, and letters that Cooper published in the local black press, with many appearing originally in Washington, D.C.'s black newspaper, the Washington Tribune. 
In the articles collected in the scrapbook, Cooper addresses many of the issues that have been important throughout her career in writing, educational poli policy and pedagogical practices, community self-determination, the intersectional politics of racial representation, the significance of race in addressing labor issues, and the complex machinations of power and oppression. Through her overt, overt statements in and to the black press about its role in challenging racial oppression and promoting race and gender equality, Cooper utilizes black newspapers and periodicals as a forum for dialogical exchange and asserts her right to participate in this public discourse. By collecting her articles in a scrapbook, Cooper also creates a material record of her assertion of a public voice. As Ellen Gruber Garvey notes in her study of American scrapbooks, for many 19th century women activists who created scrapbooks of their own writings, these texts constituted a record of extended dialogue about women's participation in the public realm, recording an extraordinary assertion of selfhood for women and their claim to act in a public arena. Thus, Cooper's scrapbook not only records her late, later statements about the role of the press alongside her continued critiques of race, class, and gender issues, but also documents her continued role as a public intellectual and activist. Additionally, her textual practice demonstrates a radical engagement with and commentaries on print culture. In the material composition of the scrapbook, Cooper adopts what I'm referring to following Sarah Dillon as a palimpsestic practice through which she engages and rewrites the existing masculinist capitalist narratives. So for example, instead of pasting her articles into a notebook or some other receptacle created specifically for that purpose, Cooper cut and pasted her 29 articles, letters, and notes into a published book with the existing text of the book covered large covered in large part by clippings from Cooper's own writings. The identity of the book, The First 50, 1889 to 1939, written by F. Florence Babcock and published by Standard Oil Company in 1939, is discernible only by the front cover. The original text of the book in which Cooper chose to archive her articles related a triumphant narrative celebrating the rise of Standard Oil in its first 50 years. Images of drilling rigs, oil wells, service crews and refineries, and short blurbs about improvements in the refinery process and the role of gasoline in propelling the automobile industry are truncated and taken over by Cooper's own writings and words. Over and above the celebratory narrative of industrial capitalism, Cooper paced her articles, weaving an alternative narrative critiquing the mass production ethos of the machine age while expounding on the impact of discriminatory practices on local black businesses and lauding the importance of service to the common good and community self-determination. One example from the scrapbook illustrates both the ideological and compositional intervention Cooper makes. On one page, of the scrapbook, Cooper pastes the second half of an article she, had, she wrote responding to a recently published study titled The Negro in Washington by A. H. Shannon. In this article, Cooper employs her readers to take a more rigorous review of Shannon's book, which Cooper argues is designed to stir more bitterness and work a deeper, more enduring economic hardship than the most brutal insults. In one of the excerpts she includes, she quotes Shannon's argument that for every trained, every Negro trained as a skilled artisan, a white skilled artisan, actual or potential, is displaced. The second excerpt expounds upon the same theme as the first. Shannon's assertions, however, enter into an uneasy relationship with the images not covered with the images of the base text that are not covered by Cooper's article. Images of white workers, of only white workers, engaged in various jobs related to oil production and refining. The juxtaposition of the textual and visual narratives here create a dissonance that troubles both narratives, calling into question Shannon's claims of displaced white workers while making visible the privileged place of white workers in this particular history of racialized industrial capitalism. Through the resituating of her articles in the scrapbook, Cooper lays claim to a male-dominated space, co-opting that existing text, rewriting the dominant narrative, and creating an archival record of her own oppositional perspective. To understand Cooper's compositional logic and to recognize Cooper's scrapbook as another book, a shadow book as it were, within her larger opus, means that we must see the scrapbook as a book. To encounter her articles as two of the 29 that are reprinted in the Lemur and Bonn edition, for instance. Sorry, she's. So here, I'll pause here, as Gabrielle was saying. I did. So you can see in this, um, so the first slide, you could see the, um, 
articles that Cooper pastes over the base text of the scrapbook. In the next slide, you can see how they're kind of juxtaposed with the white workers in the background. And each one of those articles kind of critiques different aspects of um, industrial capitalism, of mechanization. So you can see the, the kind of um, narrative that she's c constructing there. So to encounter her articles as two of the 27 that are reprinted in the Lamert and Bond edition, for instance, as discrete, standalone, individual essays gives us no sense of the larger context Cooper constructs in her scrapbook or the place that they occupy within Cooper's self-constructed archive. Publish, publishing Cooper's scrapbook in print form presents difficulties that a digital format can more easily overcome and presents possibilities to interact with the text in new and exciting ways. So you can see here, the one on the right is just the article, one of the articles that would have been pasted in the scrapbook. And the other one shows um, how you actually see the article once it's part of Cooper's scrapbook. So what I'm arguing is that when you actually have a chance to see the scrapbook as a book, you realize that these are not just discrete articles, but that Cooper actually does have, is creating another um, text. And this is how they appear in the Lemur and Bond edition. And so again, you have absolutely no sense of the way in which these articles are interacting um, with the larger text. And so one of the things that we're really interested in, in addition um, to digitizing the scrapbooks, is to kind of move from here and to start to think about what else can we do, right? So we have, we have this opportunity, I think the scrapbooks show us what can digital formats do? You know, can we lift those articles and see the base text? You know, this is the base text that she used. And get a sense, what did she choose to cover? What did she choose to leave visible, right? Um, can we create 3D imaging? Can we pick up the book and look at it? And so these are the first steps that this digitization project makes possible and some of the things that we're imagining for some of the next steps. So in addition to inviting new ways to read Cooper's archive, the digital collection also expands access to Cooper's larger body of work, to materials that go far beyond her published writings and that help us better understand Cooper's intellectual process and the challenges she faced. In other words, they help us gain insight into the process of black women's intellectual history. To illustrate this, I draw my second example from the classroom. At the beginning of the se um, semester, Catherine Bell and I asked our respective classes to explore the digital archive and to select three to four items about which they would provide a description and brief co commentary. One of Professor Bell's students, Meredith Lafrette Coutu, selected four correspondences regarding Cooper's dissertation and subsequent defense at the University of Paris Sorbonne. Translating these correspondences from French to English, Le Frère Coutu reconstructs a critical context for understanding both the intellectual and material challenges Cooper faced as a 66-year-old black woman working to become only the fourth woman from the U black woman from the US to earn her PhD. And looking at just the first letter, we learn that Cooper was unable to gain access to the French National Archives until quite late in her doctoral research. We also learn that Cooper had a much broader vision for her work than what was eventually approved. Her original title was The Attitude of France Concerning Equality of the Races, and Cooper was seeking information on immigrants in France from Japan, Africa, and India. As later documents show, however, Cooper's topic was rejected as too vague. And one month later, her topic would be added to the register for the University of Paris under the title, The Attitudes of France on the Question of Slavery between 1789 and 1848. Showing, and I just have to pause here because Cooper, Cooper she pays them back for this. So they, when, when they give her, so she, she writes her dissertation, she goes to Paris, she defends it, and then they tell her, um, so for your, your oral defense, when you come, you have two weeks to prepare your oral defense, and your question is US attitudes towards slavery from like beginning to present. And so she writes back like, you know, I feel that your question is too vague, right? <laughs> so, okay. So no good deed goes unpunished. Um, 
showing that Cooper, the attitudes of um, the attitudes of France on the question of slavery between 1789 and 1848, showing that Cooper originally was not just interested in France's attitudes towards slavery in the colonies, but wanted to examine the role of immigration and France's attitudes toward race within the metropole as well. I give this example not just to show. I give this example not just to show the opportunity this digital collection allows for charting how Cooper's intellectual projects took shape within the confines of various material and intellectual strictures, but also to show what kinds of scholarship is facilitated by increased access to this collection. Lefret Kutsu, a grad student, may or may not have had funds and access to get to the Moreland Spingarn Research Center, and she may or may not have found her way to the four French language correspondences about Cooper's dissertation. But her research in the digital archive allows her to recover and introduce critical insights about the process of black women's intellectual history. Lefret Couture's work tells us about the networks Cooper cultivated and the broad webs of socialities in which Cooper and her work moved. It shows us the restrictions Cooper faced and the expansive and tenacious response she mounted to challenge those limitations. I will close with just one more example from the archive. Like the first letter, I believe this last document is representative of Cooper's engagement with the restrictions and limitations she faced throughout her life. It is Cooper's response to a 1930 survey by Charles S. Johnson. In it, Cooper provides important biographical information, shares her attitude on black education, and provides an accounting of her educational history and attainments. Cooper's answers to the survey have been extracted to provide information, facts, and details about her life, and have been excerpted and incorporated into various biographical accounts. However, Cooper's completed survey is itself a document that tells us, I would argue, just as much about Cooper and her unwillingness to be bound by the forms that would try to contain her life in writing. In her response to question number 65, have you a racial philosophy and can it be briefly stated after all? It fills all the available lines and then wraps around to the back and covers the entire back side of the page. Concluding with her statement, to me, life has meant a big opportunity. I am thankful that my work has always been the sort that has beckoned me on, leaving no room for blasé philosophizing and rebellious resentment, with just enough opposition to give zest to the struggle, just enough hope of scoring somewhere among the winners to keep my head unbowed, though bloody. The Cooper's archive has become available. So you can see on here, I just love it, right? So that, that last slide there, where you see the, the kind of zigzag line running down the side. That's her, that's her brief response to question number 65. Um, that Cooper's archive has become available to a national and global audience of students and scholars through, through the work and dedication of the staff at the Moreland Spingarn Research Center means that we have the opportunity to read more broadly in her larger body of writing, that we have a chance to access her literary production beyond what was published in the bound book a critical step for accessing the work of 19th century black women writers especially who were so often marginalized in both black and white mainstream publishing and that we have a chance to learn about the process of black women's intellectual production. It also means that we have a chance to explore what this work says about our current moment. <clears throat> to re-examine Cooper's activism her efforts to bring equal attention to the precarious place of black women and girls and the sexualized violence they faced resonates, for example, with the Say Her Name movement. Her community advocacy, her efforts to challenge things like barber exams, which she knew were just another way to stymie the livelihood of black barbers working in Washington, D.C., is not unsimilar to force to the efforts to get women in Tennessee to get a license for braiding hair. <laughs> and her effort to preserve black women's history in her privately printed two volume collection of Charlotte Fortin Grimke's writings, for instance, is not unlike our efforts today to preserve and study black women's history. We look back, as Cooper would say, not to become inflated with conceit because of the depths from which we have arisen, but that we may learn wisdom from experience.
Okay, thank you. <laughs> what button? Oh, which button? Mm -mm. <laughs> hey, I just want to set my timer um, just for a moment. If you'll bear with me just a moment. I'm young, but I'm not technologically savvy. Um, which one is it? Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Mm -hmm. My name is Kimby Phillips, and I am the curator for race and ethnicity at the um, Schlesinger Library at Radcliffe Institute, Harvard University. And I want to first thank the more staff at Moreland Spingar and the staff at Howard University Libraries, Dr. Shirley Moody, Adriana Eiffel, um, I think Penn State, y'all brought this project together. Of course, my, of course, my institution for sending me, and also um, Dr. Lopez Matthews for organizing this wonderful, wonderful conversation. And I'm looking forward to having a further conversation with our esteemed panelists, including my mentor and advisor, Dr. Clark Lewis. I'm super excited for this conversation. It's very timely and very important, as Dr. Moody has already said. Um, in her presentation, which is pretty great in talking about the ways that we can use the collections in a digitized form and also um, the ways that we can use collections even in their physical form. But I want to take a step back and talk a little bit about my job, my role as curator for race and ethnicity at the Schlesinger Library and what it actually means to actually value these collections and what it means to preserve them and keep them in the first place. So let's step back from digital and just go to the simple fact of making sure that we hold on to these stories and making sure that we have something to digitize for the future. So um, the Sless Arthur and Elizabeth Schlesinger Library, mm -mm, let me get it right. <laughs> the Arthur and Elizabeth <laughs> Schlesinger um, Library for the, mm -mm, just stop. The Schlesinger Library, please forgive me, please forgive me. The Schlesinger Library, oh, that's not gonna look good. The Schlesinger Library is um, 75 years old this year. So that means in 1943, one of our former alums, Maud Wood Park, who was a former female reformer and suffragist, gathered her collections, gathered her books, gathered her memorabilia, gathered her information about the suffrage movement, much like Jesse Moreland gathered his information in 1914 to, to establish what was the Moreland Foundation, became the Moreland Spring Art Research Center. They gathered the, she gathered her materials and donated it to the school, the Radcliffe uh, College, to make sure that there was a place to hold the, the, the work and the writings of these women who were working for equality for women, generally. Now, the women that they collected were largely wealthy, largely white, well-educated women, and they were actually a marginalized group. We were talking about bringing people out of the margins, we we're talking about making sure that there's a group of people who had not been valued, whose works have been underrated, even though these are reformers. These are women who are working in the abolitionist movement, who then worked in the suffrage movement. They are making changes in our society, but we want to make sure that they kept them. So Maudwood Park actually started our collections, and we worked, and we worked to make sure that we had these this marginalized group, which for about 40 years largely meant wealthy white women. And in the 1970s, along when our discipline decided, and scholars and researchers and historians said, you know what, there are a lot of people who are missing. There are a lot of people who we, whose stories we don't know, whose perspectives we haven't respected, whose experiences we are missing in our, in our American narrative, we need to get those stories. And we came up with, or uh, the value came, we began to see the value in the oral history, in oral histories. So along the 1960s, 1970s, we said, let's start talking to people. Let's start finding out from themselves. These are individuals who may or may not have kept diaries, who may or may not have kept records. You know, Anna Julia Cooper is a, a um, special and, and somewhat unique in that she wrote in, in, and held papers where average women, ordinary women, um, women who were housewives, who were mothers, who were domestics, who were, um, who did not have time to keep a diary. Let's talk to them. Let's find out what they were doing and how they were doing it. So in the 1970s, the Schlesinger Library embarked upon what became the uh, black Women's Oral History Project. And over 75 women from around the United States, African-American women who were change agents, who were local activists, 
activists, who were local leaders, who were professor, um, professionals, there are lawyers, there are doctors, there are um, educators, there are housewives, there are bankers that came together and said, let's talk, let's sit down, and let's find out about your story. And so, these 75 different women, it be it seems to be like a novel thing, like all of a sudden, oh wait, they do have a story, oh wait, they do have something to say, and oh wait, they do have a face, they do have a name, they do have lives and husbands and children and so forth and so on, and so it became such a hit. There was a photographer who saw and said, oh, I want to take their pictures because not just their voice but also their face. I want to take their pictures, I want to see their names, There's a, and, and the project has been transcribed, the project, um, and there's a wonderful booklet that was produced to go along with these, with these women. And among those women, there are people who are um, alums of Howard, so Dorothy Faraby, who was a medical doctor here, um, Polly Murray, who was um, graduate from the law school. There's Dorothy West, the uh, author from who wrote The Wedding and various other um, Harlem Renaissance novels and, and fiction. And they have these wonderful, vibrant stories. And actually, our um, Black Women's Oral History Project is available online at our website. And you can hear their voices. And if you hear, if you go and you hear um, Dorothy West, who has this wonderful, wonderful energy, like she's, it's kind of on fire. She's talking and she's all over the place. And she, I mean, at one point she talks to the woman who's interviewing her and she's like, you know, I'm tired, so we're going to have to sit down. And 15 minutes later, she's still talking about whatever she was talking about. She has all these wonderful insights and she gives this wonderful look into the Harlem Renaissance. We get to hear about who's dating who and who's talking to who. And so all of those things, those backstory things that may or may not have been written down, we have that story and those things are being put forward. And so it was a great project. And actually, some of the people whose papers that they talked to, like Dorothy West, their, her papers are at the Schlesinger Library. Um, they talked to Rosa Parks. Dorothy Faraby's papers are here. Um, Flemie Kitchell, who was a home economics, the first PH, woman PhD in home economics, her papers are here in Moreland. But they talked to her as well. And so some of those women, there's a physical record somewhere. But here we are, 40 years later, and I was recently hired, so I've been working at Schlesinger for about a year and a half, and 40 years later, we're still saying we're almost, I'm not, I don't wanna say a crisis moment, but there's a, a, a urgent need to make sure that somebody is, is focusing on pulling women out of the margins. My f official title was curated for race and ethnicity, so we're talking about making sure that those marginalized groups, start with white women who were marginalized, let's pull them toward the mainstream, but we're still looking at those ethnic groups, African Americans, Asian Americans, Latinos, American, let's move all of these women closer to the mainstream argument. So we wanna talk about how are we doing that and why are we doing that still. So even with Dr. Moody's wonderful presentation of the things that we can do, so I'm assuming everybody in this room understands the importance of what's done and what can be done, but there's still a need to make sure that everybody understands that all of these voices are valid and all of these voices are important. So as I've mentioned, we have Dorothy West's papers, we have um, Florence Kennedy's papers, we have June Jordan's papers. So we have a nice base of women, um, but there's still room. There's still gaps. There's still individuals whose, whose voices and whose stories that need to be told to, to bridge those gaps that we have in our collections and in collections around the United States. Um, one of the questions that I get as a curator for race and ethnicity at a predominantly white institution is why should we take black women's papers and put them at a place like Harvard. Like, <laughs> why should we do that? I just gotta look, so I have the answer. And my answer quite simply is, okay, my answer quite simply is that our stories are so important. Our stories are so nuanced and so complex and we are in every walk of life. I think about people like June Jordan who had a, a a complex and multifaceted definition for herself. And she often rejected the kind of singular 
acceptance into this organization or into this movement or into that movement. She said, I'm not going and joining the feminists because I'm not simply a feminist. I'm not simply a woman. I'm not going to go solely with the black power movement because I'm not simply black. I have all of these different pieces to myself and I refuse to reject any one of them. And so in, in respecting the complex uh, lives of the women that we are we are whose stories we're collecting there is a place for us everywhere as black women there's a place for us everywhere you think in terms of folks like Kimberly Crenshaw who recently relatively recently coined the term intersectionality or you think about where Francis Beale was talking about in the 1970s and the double burden or the double double jeopardy and the bur double burden of being a black woman. If you think in terms of what Anna Julia Cooper was talking about when she said, when and where I enter, because she's encompassing all of the issues and all of the things that everyone has to consider. Black women have all those things, so why not? Put them in conversation with collections everywhere. When you talk about feminism, when you talk about how are black women moving in the feminist movement, so how do black women, Florence Kennedy, how does she um, converse with Betty Friedan? Both of those collections are Schlesinger. And it's nice for researchers to be able to say, let's put those women in conversation and make sure they talk. Um, that's if you think in terms of the lawyer, so Florence Kennedy is also a lawyer. So she's not just a feminist, but she's also a lawyer. You think in terms of folks like June Jordan, who's a poet, who's also an activist. You think in terms of folks like our most recent um, acquisition, Angela Davis, who is a scholar, who is an uh, activist, who is, um, She's got a lot of things. You all know her. <laughs> you all know her. So how do we put her in conversation with some of these other big name um, and change agents and folks who are moving our, our society forward? How do we make that happen? And my second answer to that question is that everything black can't come to Howard. It's just not enough room. It's, it's just not. It's not enough room. Um, it, it's not enough room, and so we have to kind of spread the love and spread spread the wealth. We just have to. I know, Lopez. Give me a second. So, <laughs> um, and then so so finally, as I'm thinking in terms of how we fill the gaps, how we move um, to talk about black women's experiences and how we make sure that black women's experiences are, are, are talked about widely, not just as black women, but as individuals, as citizens of, of these United States. We have to make sure that we value what they're saying. We have to make sure that we're in conversation um, that's most complete and most complex as humanly possible. And I'm going to sit down. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. My name is Elizabeth Clark Lewis. I'm director of public history here at Howard University. And I think it's important when we talk about um, scholarly activities, we have to be honest and upfront. So up front, I'd like everyone to know that I'm from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, that I had an appointment as a visiting distinguished professor at Penn State and that um, I'm currently working with a church called Mother African Church, which is on Fifth Street in Wilmington, Delaware. They had extensive records and resources that they were very concerned about making sure that that information came to Howard, <laughs> that there were deep concerns about the uh, materials, and it's a fascinating, fascinating center and group to work with. With that said, when we talk about preserving women's history, um, I'd like to talk about um, my own background, the descendant of a slave and his 33 children, three wives and 33 children, and that third wife, I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to interview um, four of the living children, three of which were women, and they helped me with what we call mnemonic devices. They had extensive photographs, they had extensive Bibles, and one had a diary that she found for me. And although in Virginia it was against the law for them to get more than a third grade education, with 33 children it wasn't going to be possible for them to go more than, more than uh, three years because they were all working. 
and um, they're household workers. They started off in the South and then using chain migration, they migrated out of the South. But what I learned is that there was a great deal of planning and writing and design for the way they wanted to be remembered. They had a great deal of not only material culture, um, but they had clothing. Many of them had um, extensive uh, abilities and opportunities to um, fashion their own clothes. And one woman who's referred to as simply a seamstress was far more than that. She was a designer. And whites brought her pictures. And she could replicate anything. And she did um, very, very well. So when we begin to talk about material culture and how we preserve it, it's important to get to those people who are the sources and who work in preservation. And I am drawing a blank. But the lady, give me your last name again. Ms. Tyson works with a group called Creed, which recreate uh, Civil War era women down to each stitch in the clothing. And so when you begin to talk about preservation and the way it's presented, it helps us understand presentation and preservation in an extremely different way. When we think about how people preserve materials, and I'd like to talk about preserving women's history, preserving women's history like the women that I interviewed for a book, who basically preserved what they had as they could. They um, used brown bags, and in many cases, they would wrap the materials and then put them in drawers, having enough sense to understand that that would be a protecting, protected environment. So in the homes of women that I'm going into now in Wilmington, and still because of my work here in Washington with these household workers, they're able to pull materials out, and they're in pristine shape. Understand that um, this doesn't just mean in the areas where we are. We are going to Pittsburgh. Ha uh, Howard started. Howard started. Howard began the August Wilson Society. And the August Wilson Society has had a long history of not only preserving materials about um, the writer Wilson, but we've done an extensive oral history with the people who were there when August Wilson started. Not August Wilson when he was the famous August Wilson, but these were the people who came to see his presentations in the community centers of the housing projects. And many of them went to high school with him, and many of them admitted he was, consi he was considered a little on that edge because he would sit in libraries and restaurants and mainly bars, and he would write on napkins, and he was pulling together these sources. And many of them remember him in the most intimate way. And many of them are black women. And they talk about how his impact of his plays and his writing, there, was, there were conversations in the beginning in these housing projects when he was writing about women. When they would tell him, no, so-and-so, the Jitney did so-and-so, and did, they helped him craft and understand women's history. I think as responsible stewards, of African American history, we have to respect African American, as responsible stewards of African American women's history, we have to respect African American history. And what we really are developing are what I call racial landscapes and cultural heritage management. And I would love to think that I'm so bright and I'm so great that I think of these things, but I don't. And I'd like to use a contemporary example. We are looking at the 100th anniversary of Colonel Charles Young riding from Xenia, Ohio to Washington, D.C. to prove to the United States that he was fit to be an officer as the third graduate of the Military Institute uh, up in New York. He is, was an Army officer. He had helped create the very first um, protection areas for um, the, uh, the sequoia, the great sequoias. And they, what we were tasked through a grant to look at is the fact that they have pictures of the African Americans at the base of this large mountain, Mount Whitney. They have pictures at the top. But it's still questionable if those African Americans built the roads. I'd love to know how they think they got up there. Did they <laughs> jump? We are wonderful people, but we can't jump. So we're looking at that. At the same time, and I'm going to embarrass my class, I'm going to ask my class members to stand since they embarrass me. Stand up, all of you. 
I see you in the back. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. There's a lady there with two chips. Stand up. They made it clear, well, if we're looking at Colonel Young, which was wonderful, what are we looking at in terms of those people around him? So they have forced a conversation on not just Colonel Young, but also his wife and the many individuals around him. And I'd like to, in particular, ask Mr. Wilson to stand, because Mr. Wilson, along with Ms. Page, and Ms. Edwards, and Ms. Bell, and in particular Ms. Zanders, could you stand? Ms. Eberhardt. Uh, not only looked at, are there any others of you in here? Not only looked at Colonel Young and his family, but his wife. They're down to what church they went to during the time they were here for the ride. They looked at where they, he's been able to um, stable his horse. They have given an intimate view of this issue. Thank you. And again, as I said, they forced me to think past what are those easy bounds when you talk about preserving African American history. The one person who couldn't be here is a young woman who's doing a film on um, Anna J. Cooper. She received a national endowment and hopefully she's gonna be able to use that as part of her dissertation. And Ms. Lewis, who is no relation to me, is a filmmaker from the University of the District of Columbia. And she did a film called Aunt Sis. I don't know if you've seen it. It's, ex it's wonderful. And she is getting grants to expand it. And what she's able to talk about when we, as, when, as I said in my presentation, that when we talk about cultural heritage management, she is talking about how you use film and film resources to understand how they, they filmed the house, they recreated how she had the house in that era, but what they really did was understand this racial landscape that Anna J. Cooper and African American women in general were creating. When we think of preservation of women's history and material culture, as I said, my, the group of women that I focus on are women who are not probably going to be in the uh, Radcliffe collection at Harvard. They're women who are at everyday churches, who are working almost in a way that's effortless, but not invisible. And I'd like to close with the example, as I said, of a woman who was a seamstress. And you learn, many in many cases, you learn from various people, but it's really hard to learn from your children. But I have a daughter who is a talented um, preservationist, and she was able to show how this woman, this seamstress, and her activities, and the clothing she created, each decade of her work, how it evolved, sewing initially and generally for African American, what we would consider club women, and women of the upper class, but also showing how the evolution of clothing and work evolved with women's history and women's material culture. And she uses one collection of just one seamstress and that she dug around and found. And I warned her, I said, I don't think that's gonna work. I don't, but what do I know? <laughs> and I'd like her to stand, Dr. Abner Lewis Moon, who's gonna be very angry, but she did an incredible job on using material culture. And I'm so glad Miss Beattie just walked in because this is the student when we were talking about um, Colonel Charles Young, who again in class corrected me because I was seeing him in a US context. She had done the reading and they're always so gentle. You're wrong. I said, excuse me, I'm not wrong. She said, you're wrong. And she talked about Colonel y Charles Young and the influence he had all over West Africa. I had a general sense, but again, they dug in the archives and created a whole new but very dynamic view of him, which talks about not only correcting me in the sense of as a US trained historian, I'm US centric, but we understand that there is an African diaspora element to almost every African leader and as well as the material culture. So as I said, I think that what happens is uniquely interesting
when we're talking about African American women and African American women's culture and preservation. But I ask you to remember that a significant part of what we have to preserve when it comes to African American women's history and material culture, we have to stop. We have to look for the people who have and understand their culture. And we have to listen to the words, their words, about how their cultural landscape and their material culture uh, history has evolved. Thank you very much. And again, I would like to thank those recalcitrant, often rude, very difficult students who have helped me understand uh, not only um, Colonel Charles Young, but all of history and material culture and women's history in such a new and unique way. Thank you all again. Okay. Now how can I get to my, oh, it is right there, oh my goodness. Okay. I'll put on the slideshow. No, I must slide. Nope, it's this one here. Okay. Ah, from this current slide, I think I. Would you mind helping me? I apologize. It was right there, and it looks like it's right there. And then it moved on me. Oh, I think that might have been ours. Oh, you stitched them all together. Smart. Fabulous. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, before I begin, I'd like to thank Dr. Shirley Moody Turner and her colleagues here at the Howard Univers uh, Libraries and the Moreland Springer Research Center for their tremendous work digitizing Anna Julie Cooper's papers and to give us the opportunity to come together today. We would also like to invite you guys and remind you guys to share today's events with those people who were unable to come, which they could have come, um, by posting on Twitter and Instagram. There are a myriad of um, ways you can do that, so please do remember to do so. Um, those of us with the Colored Conventions Project, uh, over here, y'all can raise your hands, say hello, and wave mm -hmm. it hi. The Colored Conventions Project has come as a crew. Um, we are honored to be here. The CCP, as we call ourselves, brings buried African American history to digital life, making available the proceedings, petitions, and news coverage of hundreds of black-led state and national conventions where tens of thousands of our cultural ancestors gathered to organize for voting and legal rights, educational equality, rest in peace to Linda Brown, thank you for your sacrifices for Brown versus Board, and fair labor practices and laws. The CCP has quadrupled the number of available proceedings and made them freely available and fully searchable at thecoloredconventions.org for the very first time. We have involved more than 1,600 community volunteers in their digitizing and have teams that create curricula for our almost two dozen national teaching partners, a committee that inputs and checks metadata and is creating a relational database, and another that supports our data visualization and the creation of research exhibits that are adopted in classrooms and that will accompany a forthcoming volume of essays. Please be on the lookout for that. The Colored Conventions movement began in 1830 and continued through the end of the 19th century. This movement, though obscured by abolition, paved the way for black organizations that still exist today. It laid the foundation, we argue, for collective agency that asserts again and again that black lives matter. My talk today will focus on the ways that archival re recovery work about black women, such as Anna Julia Cooper, have informed the CCP's approach to archival research and crafting digital exhibits. Placing black women in central positions within movements that historically obscure their presence disrupts the archival silence shrouding our historic and ongoing roles and participation. 
The color conventions movement sought to demonstrate that African Americans were already civic-minded, active participants in all aspects of American society. And to prove it, they engaged in conventions which they meticulously recorded, archived, and published in the press. The viability of black citizenship and the vitality of black life was decidedly a patriarchal project, rife with Victorian gender norms that simultaneously resisted black women's participation in public spaces. Regardless, black women persistently demanded a seat at the table in as many forms as possible. The movement's minutes, which are too often considered its sole archive, conceal the central role black women played in convention organizing and infrastructure, and renders inv invisible their labor in the black churches, press, boarding houses, educational institutions, and businesses. In truth, all the ways that they made the conventions possible to begin with. The CCP project turns to answer the following research questions. How does the Color Conventions project center and illuminate the contributions of women? How do contemporary black digital humanities researchers center women in an archive that largely renders them invisible? How does the project model recovering women for the field of black digital humanities? We argue that these questions intervene in narrow conceptualizations of black archives by treating the absences and silence of women as suspicious and counter to evidence of our intellectual and activist heritage. Convention documents typically present anonymized women as silent donors. On occasions where women were given the floor to speak, their speeches were often reduced to a single line or phrase about the aspirational value of their message. Scholarship about the published and unpublished writings of black women like Cooper reminds us that their motivational messages were only one aspect of their lifelong contributions to social justice. It is our duty as scholars to represent black women's roles in histories of black organizing in all of its complexities. As black political theorists, founders of black institutions, emerging leaders in public discourse, and highlighting their invisible labor. Mary Ann Shad Carey's participation in the 1855 National Convention in Philadelphia is an important example of the movement's archival silences. The minutes of this convention cordon off her presence strictly as an object of debate represented in single lined notes on her role as a representative of Canada and an account of who voted for and against her status as a delegate. The work of our researchers like Jim Casey and partners like Dr. Cabria Baumgartner enlarge and enhance these notations to consider how Shad Carey might instead be framed as essential to their discourses, both within and outside of the conventions, about the issues of education and immigration. Resisting her position as a procedural problem, Shad Carey exceeds the movement's practices of erasure by captivating writer William J. Wilson's attention in his co coverage of the convention in Frederick Douglass's paper, newspaper that is, offering an alternative reading of the day's events by centering her role in the debate around her as, a criti as critical to understanding the composition of the convention's exceedingly qualified uh, body of national leaders. Instead, she becomes the linchpin within the debate about emigration as a tactic for emancipation and the advancement of black people outside of America's structural racism. She comes to embody the ways that on certain issues, male leaders, even of the conventions, had turned meetings into echo chambers, and she broke that pattern. Within the same trip to Philadelphia, Shad Carey publicly debates activist and lecturer Isaiah Wares about emigration at the Banneker Institute, denoting her presence in multiple spaces. In addition, for her paper on the CCP Composium in 2015 that led to the edited collection, Baumgartner also disrupts the boundaries of time and place that frame Shad Carey's relevance to the movement. She argues that Shad Carey was also critical to the earlier 1853 Rochester meetings creation of a co-educational manual labor college institute. And here's an example of what those looked like uh, back in the day. This one is in Albany, however. 
So while Shad Carey is not a delegate at Rochester, Baumgartner suggests traces of her influence are evident on what she calls Frederick Douglass's quote unquote ideological definition of African American education. And it is evident in ways that institutionally linked women's formal education to their roles and survival in black communities. Instigated by our research questions during encounters with Shad Carey in the archive, the CCP has enriched historical and biographical accounts of Shad Carey by reframing her role in the color conventions movement with the hopes that further archival work will deepen our understanding of influential black women in this era. In similar fashion, Francis E.W. Harper and Imodia Highgate appear in the minutes of the 1864 National Convention of Colored Men in Syracuse, New York. Harper and Highgate were introduced as speakers. However, the minutes give no account of how they were introduced and their qualifications to speak on issues discussed, which we know they had relegated to the position of guests with looming questions about how the delegates perceived the women, the official record again serves to minimize them. The minutes offer no transcriptions, and research by Dr. Eric Gardner suggests news coverage also failed to note their presence at all. Readers are instead given comments about the affect, oratory skill and Christian optimism these women conveyed as cheerleaders to the ostensibly real work, and male, sorry, real and male work of political organizing. Again, our research questions and knowledge of how recovery work reveals black women were intellectual and political peers demands enlarging the body of text we engage. Gardner's talk at the 2015 symposium attempts to rectify the Syracuse meeting's vagaries by pointing to, a record, to other records of Harper's speeches in Indianapolis that better illustrate her critical roles in these spaces. She serves as an expert historian of American histories of slavery and the Civil War, and also as a public political analyst who was critical of federal failures at serving black citizens. Likewise, Gardner's talk posits that Highgate's present not only denotes her leadership role as an educator, but her published works in the Christian Recorder suggest she also engaged the public sphere as an intellectual interested in transcendentalism and its relevance to her experiences of KKK racial violence in the South. Now that sounds hot. I'd love to learn more about that. Ultimately, Garner calls on scholars to produce a litany of tools and texts for contextualizing and illuminating women's work in black organizing. We believe the Cooper Collection will play an important role in creating those tools because we can gain new, intimate knowledge of Cooper's thoughts and practices and of an exemplary black woman organizer and intellectual foremother. The CCP and the Cooper Collection's shared methodologies and interests in preservation and open access archives are crucial if we earnestly hope to transform institutional practices around valuing black life and histories. But that transformation will not come if we do not intervene in archival erasures by leveraging digital humanities tools to center and elevate black women's contributions. And we cannot fail to center and support black women in academia today either. We must hashtag cite black women and hashtag say her name and bridge the gaps that label black women unfit for DH work and unfit for equal pay and resist our erasure and dehumanization when rendered into data sets. In a voice from the South, Cooper claimed black women's destinies were evolving. When we position ourselves as the legacy of generations of black women's strivings, we discontent ourselves with acting as anything less than communities of driving change. We at the CCP are excited for the road ahead, and we hope this will lead to more collaborations. Thank you. I've known her since she was 19, so that was a moment for me. Um, I'm just gonna, my talk's very short, um, and uh, sort of a second part. I came to Digital Archives and then to the Color Conventions Project by walking a path this symposium's title illuminates. 
thankfully joining a scholarly community just able to publicly say it was dedicated to preserving black women's history and material culture as a recognizable field. I'm a student of Barbara Christian's and she was turned back the way Anna Julia Cooper was turned back in her dissertation topic when she was told that black women were not a subject, right? Um, that were worthy of a dissertation, that there wasn't enough material, right? So, um, and I remember being told this about uh, Harriet Wilson too, that I couldn't possibly really include her as a chapter uh, when I was an undergraduate. Just earlier this month, CCP's first partner in the arts performed an hour-long piece called Women of Consequence, Ambitious Ancillary Anonymous, which we helped them to craft. And it includes a section on women in the convention movement and a suite called Three Harriets, about Harriet Jacobs, Harriet Wilson, and Harriet Tubman. In the program that, um, the, in that program, this appears. There in type that hides history as well as communicates it are Harriet Wilson's birth and death dates. You can barely see them, they're right up there. Um, and her birth and death dates appear. And these were dates that no one knew just 10 years ago. They were dates I was blessed enough to recover on a research trip with Reginald Pitts to Boston and Quincy, where she is buried, and to New Hampshire for the Penguin Classics edition that we co-edited. Seeing those dates on March 15th, which was her birthday, which was the day of the performance, took my breath away. Birth and death dates. Like the rest of her life as an entrepreneur and religious speaker, as a woman whose name had been embossed on thousands of bottles of hair care products I've brought today. I don't really need to do this, but here they are. Um, that, that, uh, that we also did not know about. And um, seeing the ads that Kathy Flynn and I discovered together, which appeared in tens of thousands of ads more than 50 years before Madam C.J. Walker became famous, these dates, the most essential facts of her life had disappeared. Whoosh, gone. Her dignity stolen. Then recovered and made indisputable by a scholarly community that refuses to see black women's agency and activism erased, that insists on marking the importance and centrality of when and where they entered, just as the Julia Cooper Digital Project is doing today. Sometimes individual scholars do this work. I think of Erica Armstrong Dunbar and Ona Judge of Alice Walker and Zora Neale Hurston, of Jean Fagan Yellen and Harriet Jacobs, or the forthcoming work on Zilfil E. Law by Kimberly Blockett. Who do you think of here? And here I'm serious, take out a pen or your phone and write down the names of someone who's resurrected a black woman from a life that ends in someone's White House North, in a slanted Edenton attic or in an unmarked grave. Write down, write down. Who do you think of, a scholar or a woman who has been resurrected, a black woman who's been resurrected? Gary, I'm gonna I'm call on y'all. Y'all know it's some call and response stuff, so you know you need to be about this. All right, we ready? All right, say her name, literally, into this room. Let's call them and welcome them into this room. Thank you, thank you. These are our national treasures. If we want to activate this work of spiritual and historical recovery, and we shouldn't right, um, be shy away from saying that this is spiritual recovery work because um, intellectual traditions are very clear, right? Sort of white hegemony is very clear about the fact that this is a spiritual and intellectual, right, assertion of agency and subjectivity. So we should not shy away from saying that we too are recovering both spiritually and historically, right? A process of redignification, right, to bring Anna Julia Cooper's words here, especially in the digital age. I believe we need more than individual labor as powerful as that can be. To counter the ways in which women have been erased from the history we were partners in producing takes a certain kind of looking in, through, around, and against the archives to quote D'Angelo Bridges, 
who I think is here, right? One of Dr. Turner's graduate students. To do the work of digital recovery takes teams, and those teams, those librarians, or archivists, IT specialists, and graduate student leaders, those who are taping us now, right, as well, are best structured by ethical imperatives that link them to the work of the justice advocates we're seeking to identify and study. To avoid replicating the very way our subjects' laborers have been erased, we might best create structures that are not hierarchical, but are horizontal, and we might pledge to say and record the names of the collaborators upon which this work and community building depends. Carol Rudisell, stand up. <laughs> Curtis Small, Denise Berger, Brandy Locke, Molly Collins-White, the CC members who are with us today alongside our colleagues, Jesse Erickson and Allegra Taylor, who will be joining us next year, and those who are not here with us, Jim Casey, Anna Lacey, David Kim, Ethan Barnett, Allison Robinson, Kelly Coles, Keith Jones, Caleb Trotter, and others who couldn't be with us today. Thank you. Scholarly ethics as the all-white panel of presenters. <laughs> Ah, come on now. Really? Oh, no. We can do this. Hold on. From the current slide. Oh, and not from the current slide. <laughs> okay, now y'all got to do like some other kinds of slides. Slide, why don't you? Slide, everybody. Is that the right words? I have lyricosis. Oh, my. Yeah, hold up. Oh, man. Okay, it looks like the other ones didn't show up. That's all right. Um, you gonna help me up? Thank you, baby. I appreciate it. All right. So as the Stanford, so there's, imagine a picture of 30 white men behind you. You can do that, right? Okay. <laughs> Scholarly ethics is the all-white male presenters to a Stanford applied history conference earlier this month it, um, uh, is just the latest to illustrate are not the best are not best put into practice by people's goodwill or largesse that is by practices that often collapse when confronted with time constraints or limited networks and my I may I say just plain laziness as a digital project with practices that seek to mirror the distributed multi-site nature of the conventions themselves, we also seek protocols of friendly accountability, memos of understanding and principles of use agreements, and CFPs that formalize the ways in which we center black women in a set of proceedings that includes the entire pantheon of black male leadership and banishes all but a few women to the archival hinterlands. CCP asks national teaching partners to sign MOUs and to have their students include women as the central partners we know they are, as their cities readied for hundreds of convention participants to enter their churches, their homes and neighborhoods where they're needed to be housed and fed in a process that called for fundraising, community organizing, and infrastructure building that undoubtedly included women as central members. Our exhibit guide requires women to be represented in the exhibits. The 1,500 students across the country who have embarked on original research through the CCP curriculum write bios on women affiliated with the male delegates whose name appear on page after page, while women in the records often remain anonymous and ancillary. And here I want to acknowledge Ben Fagan, whose class produced two of those um, exhibits, which you can find on CCP. And he often credits his students right, for, for that work um, and, and sees himself as a vessel um, and in that. Anonymity is precisely what got recorded in 1848 minutes when the long-term delegate Abner Francis traveled from upstate New York to a national convention held in Cleveland with his lady. That's in the, that's in the minutes, with his lady. And was refused a first-class ticket. He recruited the presiding convention president, none other than Frederick Douglass, to return to the station to be again rebuffed. Advocating for equal treatment and transportation, the convention entered into the permanent record a unanimous shout. I, now we know where we got shout out, right? A unanimous shout against the clerk. Identifying him by name in the minutes, they made certain that he was, quote, fairly ostracized. 
The clerk is named, but who I wondered was Abner Francis's lady. So I did what anyone with expertise in historical research does first. I Googled him. <laughs> and with wife, what came up was a well-researched entry on Sidna E.R. Francis, who was no one's no-name travel partner in her time, but rather the president of the Ladies' Library and Progressive Improvement Society for Buffalo and more. What did I learn by following the story of an anonymous woman, as project protocols direct me to do? The women not only opened their homes to delegates when conventions were held nearby, but they accompanied their husbands and probably their brothers and fathers and pastors to conventions. And then I noticed something quite amazing to me at least. The information appeared in a single Google search because, it turns out, Heather Sinkinson studied with Dr. Kimberly Blockett, one of our earliest national teaching partners, who following our MOU had her students turn to databases, to the black abolitionist database and the growing and rich secondary literary literature to find associated convention women. Three years later, I followed the all but silent archival lead, and because of that protocol, that rule, that guideline, there was the puzzle piece waiting to be clicked into space. Providing protocols of engagement for publics and students helps to stitch historical scraps and patches together across temporalities and space that print technologies and plain goodwill cannot facilitate. Amassing not only an archive but historical narrative so that cultural ancestors take their rightful places over time and space in a way that Harriet Wilson and Anna Julia Cooper and so many of us are conjoined with someone like Lucille Clifton when she says, won't you celebrate with me? What I have shaped into a kind of life, I had no model. Born in Babylon, both non-white and woman, what did I see to be except myself? I made it up. Here on this bridge between sunshine and clay, my one hand holding tight my other hand. Come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. Thank you to our historical ancestors who survived and waited patiently for our coming to reassure us that we do have models to follow and contest, to study and place in conversation. We are not the first. Congratulations to the Anna Julia Cooper Project, and thank you for bringing us together today to celebrate and to embrace all the textures of feeling that word carries for us as we recover our lost and found worlds and works and digitize them together. Thank you. If anybody wants to see bottles. <laughs> Well, that was wonderful. And I hope you all are enjoying yourselves. We are now going to have a panel discussion and ask your, for your questions and kind of discuss the importance of preserving black women's history. So I would like to introduce Ms. Adrena Ifill from Doubleback Global Productions, who will manage our Q&A. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, I'd like to invite our speakers up to take the stage, and we're and I invite you all. I know that you've probably been social media, but now is the time for us to actually ask those questions in person. And so there's going to be a microphone over here, and then there's a microphone in the back if needed, if need be. So get ready for that. I'm going to start off with a few questions, but then we definitely want to hear from you all.
Okay, great. So everybody can hear us? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Well, this has been an incredible panel. I didn't realize we were going to church, but we, <laughs> we did. And Easter week, we are resurrecting a lot of wonderful, wonderful stories that sadly ha were on the margins, but no longer, um, thanks to this esteemed panel here. So I have a few questions that I wanted to sort of kick off the discussion with, and then we're definitely gonna hear from our also esteemed guests that have joined us. And I'm gonna just start off with Dr. Phillips. I'm gonna go to Dr. Foreman, um, each of you taking a turn as you see fit. How does collecting black women's archives speak to our current cultural and political movements and activism? Just a small question. <laughs> right, a small question. So, um, thank you. Um, e easy, as, as um, the last panelist just said, nothing's been done before. And so one of the things that we say in terms of what we're collecting and how we're collecting and how it influences today's society, not just in our scholarship, but just in having our current activists understand what's been done already, what worked, what didn't work, how does it work, and being in conversation again with those activists in the past. Like there's no reason to do something that failed 50 years ago, or there's no reason not to do something that was successful 50 years ago, um, simply because you're not uh, you're not sure that it happened. And what you see with a lot of the current activists um, is that they are paying attention, that they are looking at what has happened in the past. They are doing their research, they are having those conversations, and so the archives is a wonderful place for them as almost like a training ground for what they're gonna encounter and what they're um, going to face in today's um, activism. I would like to add that, again, having done undergraduate work, I was in a department with Merz Tate, Elsie Lewis, Letitia Woods Brown, Olive Taylor, and the chair was Lorraine Anderson Williams. These were, these were five accomplished African American women historians and scholars. So I uh, frequently I had to remind myself that when they talk about coming from the margins, I didn't experience that. I experienced a department where it was understood that African American women had value and probably I think the most influential historian that was from outside my department was Helen Edmonds from North Carolina Central who we had a lecture by uh, Dr. Um, Franklin. John Hope Franklin, and he talked about Dr. Edmonds and her support when he had this idea called From Slavery to Freedom. So I think that there is a, a sense of how African American women's history is done um, in institutions where it is quote unquote new versus African American women's history where it is a part of the, I would say the intellectual fabric and it makes up the actual paradigm uh, that you operate under. And I think it served me well as a student at Maryland, first woman, first African American in this department. And then when I came in the first day, they said, the person said, you can't come in there and look. What do you come, turn around third day, don't come in. I said, excuse me. So they've come, they've already gotten the trash. I had already been a professor for four years. Yes, the trash. And I, my suit, my briefcase, your African American face means you're here to collect trash. So I, th that served me well in the sense of it prepares you for the realities you're gonna face in these non-African um, American environments. It's like a, it, it insulates you. And, and my response was, I'm here for class. And I sat down, but you, you, understand that where it is something quote unquote new, it resonates in a different way from me, for example, where it was understood that you were going to do history and you were going to include African American women. And so I just think that it, as you said, it's, it's, it's a part of this activism, but I would encourage as people understand scholarship that they look to many of those earlier scholars who were at institutions who were doing it, who continued to do it, even if they were considered invisible. They, very, they were very active and very serious scholars. And I think that that is an important part of 
what has to be understood when you talk about African American women's history and it, its legacy. Thank you. Um, so thank you for the question. And thank you again. Um, just want to say thank you one more time um, to Dr. Lopez Matthews. Um, and to Ms. Adrena Eiffel. Um, just really incredible partners to work with. Thank you. Um, and, and to my class, too, for making the trip. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Um, <clears throat> so I think that. Uh, I guess what I heard when you asked that question was Angela Davis, you know, mm -hmm. freedom is a constant struggle, mm -hmm. right? And so thinking about, um, you know, the archives are so important, but it's also the, kind of the process of, of building and maintaining and passing on those archives that is so critical. Um, Kimberly Crenshaw was just at Penn State um, a couple of weeks ago, and she talked about the erasures, you know, the erasures of black women as a kind of intersectional violence. And thinking about the archives as, as one kind of response and antidote to that. Um, and building, you know, building on what has been done before. And I think, you know, I wrote down um, when you were asking about women who have, have um, done the recovery work. And th that work continues, you know, it's just work that, that continues and, um, you know, white supremacy as a structure is, is um, very nimble, right? And is constantly changing. So the responses that people had in the 19th century and the 18th century, um, those responses maintain. You know, they, they shift and they, they change to meet new circumstances. But, you know, like Cooper said, we learn wisdom from looking at these strategies that people have developed um, to address these challenges. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there. I might, I might say more in a little bit, but I'll, I'll stop there. Um, I think what is most um, powerful about the way that activists today are, are encountering um, the new landscapes of conducting their work is the quickness and almost the viral nature of everything that they do, right? They are so much alike their you know, cultural ancestors in their commitment to preserving and to refusing to be erased from the media and from the public view, right? Our violence will not be behind closed doors. We will not be silent about it. Oh, a little closer, perfect. <laughs> um, but I wonder what activists would think about if their frame of reference changed a little, if the ancestors um, that people who were protesting Stefanzo Clark's murder in Oakland, shutting down the convention center where the basketball game was, if instead they were not linking themselves to um, Mammy, uh, not Mabel, sorry, maybe, Mabel, no, mm -hmm. not Mabel, um, um, I'm blanking. Give me a hand. Um, throw, throw the whole Jet magazine cover. Oh, Mamie, Mamie, Mamie Till. Till. Mamie yeah. Till and her effort to prevent the erasure of her son's disfigurement and violence, but instead going even further back to the color convention minutes, thinking about all of the detailed stories about lynchings that were created there in this document to do the same work. Um, if they think about instead of how difficult it was to organize throughout the South during the Freedom Rides, Riders Movement, what about what it took when it was the 19th century and people were still in horses and buggies and carriages and, and moving by train and there was no planes. What, what do we do with that, right? What do we do um, differently when we think about the true legacy of our work and how we might center our self-care throughout this, this process? We have been doing this for generations and we accumulate that um, not just that struggle, but that pain and that, that suffering. And I think that we could also look to our ancestors, ancestors not just for a larger understanding of the legacy of the work, but also the survival, right? They survived that. Some of them survived till they were 100 years old still fighting. So, you know, how do we consider our self-care um, as a reflection of their, their work and how do we continue to to honor that and to honor ourselves um, when every day we have to stand up for this fight. 
Um, so that's what I would say. Yeah. If white supremacy is nimble, mm -hmm. patriarchy is also so very nimble. And it's um, amazing to me as someone who um, loves men and loves male identity, you know, anybody who male identified folks who are not patriarchal, um, to think about how we still have to deal with um, the erasure of black women um, in so many um, realms. And to go back to, to Angela Davis, right, um, who talks all the time about how black women are the fastest growing prison population, but we always talk about uh, men who are imprisoned. I mean, we, we know that there are more men, black men in prison and in, in, in parole than there are in colleges, right, et cetera. What, where, where do black women fall in that? So the question, it seems to me, you know, uh, that motivates this work in so many ways for activists today is that they're still struggling with what we've always had to struggle with, right? Which is the erasure of black women. I'm, say her name says that somebody ain't saying it, right? You know, um, and it remains um, up to our community um, to think about centering black women in activism as well and for our community not just the women in our community but for our larger community to take folks to task when they do things like this amazing article that just came out about black male wealth not being passed on black family wealth not being passed on to black men right and not leaving it to black women to have to articulate why we are important and we need to be um, centered and acknowledged and when we do that work, not to think of that as some kind of um, betrayal of black men, um, when black women have been about supporting black men and male identified folks for a long time. So it just seems to me that we need to do this work together as a collective um, to make sure that our whole community, our cousins and our brothers and our sisters, right, and our siblings and our uncles and our aunts, right, are taken care of, um, and not to continue to ask black women to have to do the labor to protect ourselves and to protect our community members, right, um, our sons um, and our nephews at the same time. So um, I, I ask for that help in this community and in all communities, right, that we, that we, so, we shoulder this burden together and that activists don't have to do it all, at, you know, both at once all the time. Thank you so much. And I'm going to ask one more question because I definitely want to get to you all without running out of time. So go ahead and you can get up and go to the um, microphones if you choose to. Um, I have one question because I have to remind myself you guys aren't in my living room because <laughs> I, I have a lot more questions. But I'm going to I'm going to switch a little gears and whoever wants to jump in and answer, feel free. Um, we talked sort of the, one of the impetus as far as being here is the digital humanities. So that's a personal favorite of mine. Mm -hmm. And as you were um, talking, Dr. Foreman, I was thinking about um, the, po the possibilities. And I was also thinking in all the conversations about the mythologies that are out there, the, the, the um, incorrect facts, or in, you know, inconsistencies and um, errors that have been passed on to believe certain things. So if you were, each of you, or whoever wants to stretch, what would you imagine that digitization can do to expand this conversation? What in your wildest imaginations in this 21st century where we have all these tools that we can really reach back as far as we can possibly reach back um, into people's drawers mm -hmm. for the material culture, mm -hmm. um, into the archives that we sit in these books, what's hidden in there on the written page, what's underneath um, mm -hmm. in terms of the scrapbook example and mm -hmm. what's actually going to fall out of a dust jacket mm -hmm. that maybe have been put there on purpose but not part of a bound um, collection. What, what would you, what would you want to see? What would you want to um, have illuminate for the next generation? Okay. <laughs> she said anybody jump in, but okay. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, I guess as a curator for the Arthur and Elizabeth Schlesinger 
archives on the history of women in America. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> um, one of the, uh, yeah, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. Of that. Um, one of the things we have to think about, and I like that you said at the end to talk about how do we think about for what's in the future, um, to reach back. But one of the really interesting things we have to do as curators, as preservationists, as people who are keeping the record is to not only reach back but also to look forward. So when you think in terms of not just what was important, what do we think was important, what actually was able, did we actually keep, but where are the things that are missing and how do we fill in those gaps for the future? So we think in terms of thinking over time. Um, and so in the digital humanities, I think it's a really, really wonderful way of reaching not just through time but also through space. As we've already said a few times, there are people who are doing research research right here at Moreland, but they're not here at Moreland. They're looking at the Anna Julia Cooper papers and they're in France and they're comparing and they're looking at her life there and they're looking at how she affected um, women there, not just women, but society there and how she also affected society here. And so we're thinking over time and space and we're moving in ways and in directions that is something that I don't know that they could have imagined um, in Anna Julia Cooper's day. I remember having a conversation with Paul Coates and I asked him um, from Black Classic Press and I was asking him about science fiction and what was happening. He was like, Kimby, we're living in science fiction right now. The things that we're able to do with the digital humanities and how we're able to produce books and publish books and publish work with very few people and limited space and limited time and also limited funds was something you couldn't have imagined 30 years ago. And so you think in terms of moving through time and space in, in ways and in routes that are not linear, that are not um, narrow, that are wide and that can go in ways that we can't think. So my thoughts are to say, what I can imagine, I'm just looking forward to the next generation being able to do things that I can't even think of. Um, and I want to be able to do the work to make sure that they can do the things that we can't even think of. And I think that there's one group of people that haven't really been mentioned that we should mention, particularly when it comes to digital humanities, are the people who are processing the archivists who are doing the, the describing, both in the physical descriptions and also the metadata that are doing the description so that when you go to look and you say, well, are we doing black women, well how are we describing black women? Are they colored women? Are they Negro? Are they club women? Those things are very important. So we talk about how we have this understanding of who these women are and who's saying it and who's not saying it. Um, definitely want to give that shout out to those folks who are doing that work, particularly in the digital humanities. I think that when you talk about engendering history and framing new paradigms in history, that Again, as an oral historian, I just think that there are ways that these oral histories and their preservation, these issues are so important. I'm thinking of um, the people who worked, and they're still alive, with Rosa Parks. People think of her always with the start of the bus boycott, but for a decade before that, she was doing extensive research on African American women and violence uh, in the different areas of the rural South. and understanding how those voices have to be captured. They're not going to sit down and write books. They're not going to, they don't have the time, the expertise, whatever. But there are those people who worked with major persons in history and it's just not being captured. And I just think that it, it is incumbent upon us when we have these opportunities. I'm looking at a student who is doing legacy institutions. These institutions, Ms. Edwards, who have, they no longer exist. But they were very important to the African American community as trade schools, training schools, et cetera. And she has made it her business to look at these schools and look at the important impact they had on the African American community. These histories are there, they're yearbooks, it's there. How do we begin to reach out and understand uh, new ways of approaching history? And just before I hand the mic over, I'd like to also recognize Dr. Dana Williams, who's chair of the Department of English here, who um, her students have done phenomenal works in new ways of engaging history and then writing about the impact of violence and women and these institutions. So I do think that it's important 
to understand these issues, as you said, how they involve and these digital issues, but very importantly, um, in our outreach, we have to reach beyond traditional walls and understand the importance of people who uh, are engaging history on the most basic community level and the significance of their voices and, that, and the retention of those stories and voices. So I would I would add to that and echo that and um, I guess in my wildest dreams I mean if we're gonna go there, um, you know, I, I think exactly what you were saying. Thinking about how could we use digital humanities to capture um, and make accessible everyday experiences like just a, such a broad range um, beyond you know even what what is been maintained or recovered in, in different institutional structures. And then if I'm gonna keep going, um, you know, I would love to see new ideas about knowledge production emerge from, from our, our rethinking of the digital humanities. And I would like to see black women's um, work and writing drive the structures of what DH does as opposed to the other way around, right? And trying to continue to think about how can we use the existing structures to, to fit black women's work into those structures and, and see that kind of flipped on its head um, and think about what do we need to capture these stories? What do we need to capture the range and mode um, of expression and communication um, that just doesn't get captured in some of these more traditional um, formats? And, you know, I, I think that you know, um, what Professor Foreman was speaking about in terms of seeing that um, dynamic relationship between what is happening in the digital humanities and what is happening in community and mm -hmm. institutional spaces and um, seeing that kind of organizing be the, the kind of harpy for um, the work that, that we do going forward and knowing that there's a reciprocal relationship between um, DH projects and organizing on the ground and collaborative work. Um, I've been really seeing collaborative work kind of drive um, what happens in this, this next iteration. Um, I think actually in my wildest dreams, I have two specific uh, notions that come out of, of uh, what you've just said. Um, the first in my wildest dreams, I imagine a community, a large and growing community of young black women who are get to be digital nerds, unapologetically, paid equally, celebrated equally, um, and no one is staring at them as the unicorn in the room, like, what are you doing here? Oh my God, it's either amazing or it's quite possibly our downfall, right? I would be, right? It would be <laughs> one of those beautiful moments. And um, I, I didn't realize I wanted that until I joined the um, sort of digital team, our studio lab right now it's in CCP that's working on our website. And we have a very diverse room. Um, but I'm fairly new to some of the elements of this work and I'm sitting there as a black woman in this room, learning how to deal with coding and um, with transferring data and, and thinking about how this should be user friendly and ADA friendly or um, compliant. And I nerded out completely. And I've never done that before around DH. And I said, wow, is this what young black women should be feeling when they go to coding classes for the first time because they now have a grant? right, that they never had before, right? Why aren't we funneling young women into these spaces? Why aren't we encouraging black women scholars to explore in this realm? Um, and if they can feel that, feel that joy too, right, that's in my wildest dreams. Um, and the other part is that part of why I love the archive and why I think making it accessible through um, digital platforms is that the archive will will demonstrate um, pleasure and just internal like self-value in surprising places that 
um, people need to, to read and see for themselves. You really need to have that moment. So I, I was in a class recently with uh, Professor Laura Helton at the University of Delaware, and she brought for us photocopies from an archive of oral histories that were taken by sociologists um, at an HBCU. And she said, very few people ever look at this because it's uncatalogued, not digital. Um, basically, it's, you have to go to that box and happen to stumble upon it to see it. And in it, there are these beautiful stories um, that these sociologists recorded of people telling their experiences in slavery, um, being the last generation, and also conveying it in that space to their grandchildren and their children. And they are so honest about the ways they resisted, the ways that they sassed, the way that they you know, threw shade on everything, but also centered their survival. Um, and I, I rarely get um, an opportunity to see that in scholarly settings. I have to go looking through archives. I have to go over and over and over again through Harriet Jacobs' book in order to revive that feeling and to say, wow, we, we had this. We, we, we had our moments of pleasure and just sass and wonderfulness. Um, and I think we need that to be in more spaces for more people to access. Um, so that you know, our we're not the angry black woman in contemporary society. We are we come from a long heritage of shade and wonderfulness in um, in embracing our pleasure and putting that above other constraints and, and oppression. So yeah. I think I'm really boring when I come to dreaming, <laughs> right? And so I would want to dream not only with my sister historians and archivists mm -hmm. um, and um, literary historians and oral historians, but also with the technologists in the room. I, I need them to like put, throw some color in my dreams. <laughs> um, and so I would, I would want to dream with them. But when I'm dreaming by myself, I dream, I think, the dream you articulated so clearly, which is that we recognize that communities know their own histories and that communities are the unlockers of those histories and we need to listen to them. So I would affirm that uh, CCP has been um, running workshops recently that um, one, you need to have those communities in the room, mm -hmm. right, before we can have that kind of community knowledge and respect for that community knowledge mm -hmm. there. And so we've created protocols when we are asked to speak. So we don't speak alone anymore. That's why Brandy is here, and, um, and we, we just don't do that, right? So, um, and we also don't go to speak without sending them a sheet of everybody they need to invite, right? So the HBCU near there, you better, speak, all of them, all, okay, the English professor, the head of public history. I'm not trying to go to, you know, a Tulane and not have an Xavier there, right? So, um, so we have a protocol. Black bookstores, we want those people there. We want a, a, a flyer there, right? So we have a whole list of people who we want to be in the room with because that's our community. And um, because it's easy to forget that if you're at a, a PWI being funded by PD, PWIs, being invited by PWIs, and you have to remind them, right, um, uh, that to get a room that looks like this, you actually have to work. You have to do some work. And then people come, and then they're all surprised, right? <laughs> so, you know, you invited, they will come, right? Mm -hmm. So then we get in rooms with workshops, and the ways in which DH can connect the local to the global is just so exciting to me. And so we have them, um, we invite people to read uh, convention minutes from their, own, from their own states, from their own cities. And they know stuff we don't know. They know stuff that Philip Foner didn't know when he was annotating, right? Like they know, right? So they know who all the families are, right? Denise was there at this workshop we just did at Tulane, right? And it was the folks from Dillard, and right, and at Xavier, and, uh, and the community, right, who knew all, who knew who these folks were. So Dillard, man, I'm in the wrong place. No, I'm in the right place. Um, so, um, so all of a sudden, all this knowledge comes together. So we're thinking about holding annotatathons 
um, and involving communities like the church you're working with to go back to their documents to figure out how what technology we need in the room right in order to capture that knowledge and then how do we create a curriculum that allows people who are teaching classes right Ben and the chair of English and the chair of public history to then go think about where the secondary resources can affirm or not confirm right so that we have have like several eyes on the material that is coming through the annotate-a-thons, right? So we're dreaming about the ways in which the local and the community voices who know their own history way better than we do, right, can bring that into a format that is mediated through digital technologies and that are brought then out to other communities in scholarly arenas to um, affirm and integrate that into um, a, a line of scholar, you know, sort of knowledge production um, so that we can capture that oral history in collective and local ways. Can I have another drink? Yes. <laughs> Did you say, can yes. I have another drink? Did you say another drink? Did you say like, oh, I'm sorry. I, I, we're in her, we're in her, in her living room, so I thought we might be, you know. We're, we're in her living room, so I'm gonna have this one drink real quick. Um, I always think, I always think when I talk to potential donors and researchers and scholars, and I think in terms of the kind of, um, domino effect of how scholarship affects our society and our life. Um, and it's nice to have the conversation about how digital humanities will affect scholarship, but I always think to say, oh, well, you know, I want to, in my wildest dream, this digital humanities project will change our water cooler conversations. It will change our societal conversations. It will change when you ask about those myths, when you have those, those things that we take for granted that are wrong, but we take it for granted anyway with this easily accessible material will change those narratives and change those conversations. So the scholars, so the, we're collecting these materials and the scholar, and then we're digitizing materials and then the scholars will access these materials, they'll write the books and then the movies will be made, the television shows will be made and then the wider populace will have a new understanding of what has happened. So you think about hidden figures, you think about, um, that's the only one I got right now. <laughs> <laughs> think about hidden figures. You think about Wakanda. Or what's the name of the Black movie? Black Panther. That's the name of the movie. Um, you think about all of these kind of transformative. You think about what Marshall, the movie that just came out. Uh -huh. These kind of figures where we think about, oh, we know who he is, or we know who she is, but we don't oh, really know. Mm -hmm. We have so now we're complicating the conversation. So it's beyond oh what we're thinking and you know nerding out. Yeah, we want to nerd out. We want to be able to nerd out, and also our neighbor who's not going to nerd out can also get excited about what we're excited about and so that also makes that anomaly like oh I'm not the only one there's somebody else and so for my wildest dream that would be probably it as well so <laughs> questions from the audience we have about five more minutes so anybody wants to nerd out on the microphone feel free <laughs> Just a, um, first a quick comment and then a question. Uh, Kenby, you mentioned Flemmy Kittrell as a n prominent nutritionist, but I want everybody to know she was a, a head of the home economics department that was right across the way for many years. Um, but my other question is, and I'm gonna use another term I just heard, knowledge production. Um, some of the contemporary people think we're just discovering these a long time stories. And just to give you an example, I have a photograph that was taken in 1908 uh, that includes a picture of a float um, that alludes to Susie Taylor, who was a nurse during the Civil War. And one of my educated friends said, they knew about that? So in other words, in 1908, how did they know about Susie Taylor? As if we just discovered this stuff in 19, yes. I mean, in 1960, for instance, or today. So many people now are discovering, uncovering diaries, letters, and so on. My question is, and I heard you say somebody's researching scrapbooks, okay. What is the precedent here? In other words, why did our forebears write diaries? Why did Anna J. Cooper have the audacity to create a scrapbook? You know, I had a conversation one day with Judy Moore Ladder, she teaches communications here, and she had found some letters, love letters that were exchanged between her parents, I guess World War II or so. And she said there was a note in the drawer she discovered it when, after her mother died. There was a note in the drawer that said, don't throw these letters away. Uh -huh. So Judy and I said, or Judy said, they knew yeah. that we would want to document their stories one day. So the question is, are we looking at why they wrote even uh, Harry Jacobs and so many other people that we don't know about right now? 
Why did they write? And why did they know that their stories would be important one day? And please tell us your name. Thank you. I'm Linda Critchlow White. <laughs> Anybody want to take that? I think that um, Ms. Critchlow White, um, who is very well known for uh, documenting um, data, hit it on the head that they knew that we that these are important stories and it's our obligation to bring them to the fore but I also think that there is a nagging feeling I have is that uh, I did a film called Freedom Bags with Stanley Nelson that looked at um, women and work particularly household workers in 1990 and at the end uh, the issue of a dream and the woman ends the film by saying I wouldn't have no dream mister I was too busy working mm -hmm. and then she talks about her life and this work that she did so dreaming can be important but you have to put it within the context of people's realities and so I think that that that's the key understanding your, their realities and I also think respecting it just becomes so important as you said to understand what are the institutions contiguous to to these major institutions that may have existed long before them when you remember that other than the University of District of Columbia, Howard older than Catholic, Georgetown, American, um, George Washington, but it's in a sense that um, how do we sort of figure out how to fit Howard in when it probably should be the other way around. And I'm only using that in the sense of Xavier, but also these legacy institutions that Ms. Edwards is looking at, many of them evolved right on the cusp of the Civil War. And they have hundreds and hundreds of records. Where are they? In people's homes, who's looking at them? And more importantly, who's understanding this rich legacy that they've been able to weave into the social fabric of the community where they exist? Your question? <laughs> First of all, I'd like to thank each of you for your presentations. This, this has just been a truly moving um, program. Uh, Dr. Clark uh, Lewis, I think you probably don't remember, but I heard you speak at the University of Delaware many, many years ago, and I still recall um, how you gave me a new perspective on the shopping bags that the domestics <laughs> carried home and how they were a source of pride because it meant that they could come home at the end of the day and they didn't have to be live-ins. Um, but I have a couple of uh, technical questions for uh, Dr. Phillips and for Dr. Moody Turner and then one for everyone. Uh, for Dr. Phillips, can you talk a little bit about the percentage of materials that have been digitized, uh, black women's materials at Schlesinger that have been digitized, and how you go about prioritizing those collections that do get selected for digitization. And for Dr. Moody Turner, I'm curious to know, um, as you were working with the Anna Julia Cooper papers, did you get a sense of um, the extent of the body of her work that m might reside outside of her papers and is there any prospect for digitizing mm -hmm. those materials and then for everyone on the panel um, as we are creating digital materials um, so is everyone else and uh, Google in particular is uh, moving things along at a great pace how do we how do we keep now from having such volume of digital materials that our materials aren't again hidden um, and I guess expanding from that is there any thought on the utility of portals or some other way of highlighting um, all of the materials that we are digitizing Okay, let me, that was a, that was, that, that was an oral, that's going to be an oral dissertation. Um, <laughs> so I would say, I just want to um, invite everyone, we're, what we're going to do is, um, we're going to have a reception afterwards, so we want to invite everyone and you'll be able to ask um, our panelists individual questions. And we'll, let me take yours, I hope hopefully it's short. It is. It is. Okay. Uh, okay. And then of once you ask your question, we'll have the responses and then we'll close out. Okay. Uh, just to conclude, because uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Matthews, for, for this event. And I'm glad to see an all-women uh, panel. <laughs> At least here it, it happens. Um, and um, my question is, where from here, where do we go now? 
because the issue of digital history, and I know that all of you, you are uh, doing work uh, with preservation in different ways, but um, from the, the very short experience that I have seen in conferences, people who are doing digital history in terms of uh, digitizing documents, um, I see very few black academics involved in that. And this is very problematic uh, because uh, I see, for example, one example of that is that program by the, the British Library, the Endangered Archives, and I see academics, and there are a handful of them, who are um, coordinating these projects and going indeed even to other countries to do this kind of work and collect the black archives, and after, at the end of the day, they own the archives, they control the archives, they come to the conferences and they display how many projects they are involved in showing that they control these projects. Mm -hmm. My question is uh, whether or not is there, e there is anything being done, in, because you are doing these uh, individual initiatives, but I ask myself in terms of a group. I had a question the other day, like, oh, these archives at Moorland, that may be something to be done there to digitize that. I said, it's, it's being done. <laughs> uh, you don't need to go there to, to <laughs> digitize that for us. But um, it, it's very uncomfortable, because in this space here, I would say that is uh, pretty much a comfortable space, because uh, we are not being questioned about that. But most part of the time, when you go to these conferences on databases, the transatlantic slave trade database, I would say that is one of the biggest examples, is male-dominated and are white men who are doing that. And I think that we should be paying attention to these things because um, in the real world, this is what is happening. And I am really glad to see more and more projects uh, of digital history and ask, urge you to continue doing that and especially to establish these networks because this is very important. And, and tell us your name. My name is Ana Raujo, uh, Department of History. <laughs> okay. okay, I have uh, closing statements, probably good that I'm at the end. Um, I'm a member of the group called Freed, I think Dr. Clark mentioned it, Female Reenactors of Distinction. We're a sister group to the Civil War, African American Civil War Museum. And um, so we are, have taken it as our mission to resurrect and keep alive the, the stories of freed women during the Civil War period. And um, so know that uh, there are people out there working on the behalf of black women's stories. Uh, in the absence of actual diaries, we find as much information as we can through research and give them a voice mm -hmm. so that they are not lost in history and their accomplishments are made known and so keep an eye out on uh, what we're doing and we invite your support and also encourage you to come see the, uh, new, the museum so that uh, we can keep these stories alive. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. So, so much. <laughs> um, oh wow. Let's go back. Um, I'm going to answer it as briefly as I can which... Thank hmm. you. <laughs> which is not very brief. Um, I went back to one of the original questions which was um, about digitization at the Schlesinger and how much is digitized on um, black women at the Schlesinger. And first I have to say that we have a large body collection and um, in total we have a, a small percentage of our collection is being digitized regardless of, of race or ethnicity and it's it's less than 5% because there's so much material. It's a lot of material. We have over 3,500 manuscript collections and hundreds of thousands of published volumes and so we don't have the capacity as of yet to digitize everything and I don't know if anybody does, right? This is just not, you know. Um, but we do have quite a few collections that are digitized. Dorothy West collection is digitized in its entirety and is available online. Our oral history project, Black Women's Oral History Project is digitized and is available online and we have par portions of other black women's collections like um, Polly Murray and Florence Kennedy are digitized and they're available online and that is one thing that we are doing is as we digitize things we try try to make them available online immediately. Um, and the process of trying to decide what we digitize and what order we put it, we put it in. There is a committee, we talk about, we look at um, 
the, the condition of the material, we look at use of the material, we look at trends and scholarship, we look at um, weighing a lot of different things and then try to, at that point, make a priority list for this quarter and then we'll have another priority list for the next quarter and so forth and so on like that until we can do um, as much as we can. But again, we have a lot of material and we're constantly trying to get more material, both um, paper and born digital. And so all of that, you know, I, that's the best answer I can give for that. We do have a lot, quite a few collaborative efforts that we've made, including a, a digital for our, portal for our Judy Chicago collection. Where we're working with um, Penn State. We're working with um, us and in another repository. So portals are very important for heightened awareness and accessibility for collections, um, regardless of race or ethnicity. And um, where do we go from here? In about two weeks, the Radcliffe Institute is actually gonna host a um, workshop where we've invited some 50 institutions, HBCUs, uh, predominantly white institutions, Ivy League institutions, so the Big Ten, the Sisters, um, state schools. We've invited the federal government and we've, um, from National Archives as well as the National Park Service, to have a conversation about how we can work together and how we can work together as a collective and move our discipline forward in as far as digital humanities and creating collaborative projects. And also we're trying to get people in the room so that they can have more projects like what Penn State did with, with Moreland and what we've actually done a project with um, Spelman College so to digitize some of the materials there. So we're trying to move the conversation forward. So in two weeks and it will be um, recorded and I will see if I can send links out um, to individuals so that you can have that information. So we're trying to help to foster uh, an environment so we can have relationships so that folks can have those partnerships and then if we can have a large collective, that will be something that will be there. Athena Zach Jackson is actually one of our um, advisory committee members to help put it put that um, event on so we are working we're trying to move things forward it's a short way I can go I'll make mine very quick I do hope that again picking up on your dream issue that um, people understand the importance of community-based resources and respecting the resources and the work um, that has been done um, I'm drawing a blank and I apologize um, archivist the late archivist Davis from D.C., um, Clarence Davis yes, yes. and Bill Branch. Bill Branch, I apologize, <laughs> archivist Branch. Um, blame it on my head, not my heart. But they have done an incredible oral history collection of community-based data. And that is the kind of material I'd like to see us because it's done, it has been done, it relates directly to the, um, I would say the regional history, but they focus so much on the words, the actions, the lives, employment realities of everyday people. And it's just a huge, and there are many of those collections that are out there. And I would like to see um, a focus on um, not simply what can we do, but understanding and respecting what has been done mm -hmm. and how do we then incorporate that. As I said, even down to Creed, which is working with material culture, literally every stitch follows uh, of the outfits they wear f are, are historically, uh, th they follow history. So they're all sorts of different and innovative ways of understanding and approaching and acquiring and most importantly respecting history, women's history in particular. Thank you. I will be brief as well. Um, so just to, to get back to your uh, question, Carol, um, the I, Howard, the Moreland Spain Guide holds the majority of the Cooper papers that are um, that we know about that are kind of extant. Um, Oberlin has a couple folders of Cooper's papers as well. And then there are traces of Cooper's work kind of throughout. There's some in the Du Bois um, archives. There's some in the Chestnut. Chestnut's got a picture of Cooper. I'm not sure what that's about um, in his papers. Um, but there's traces of Cooper kind of throughout. And it, that was one of the things that also kind of motivated this project was the idea of having to look for traces of Cooper, you know, in the archives of others, usually men, right? And the other thing too that motivated it was looking for places where she should have been, you know, and that's been, it's been hard, you know, but when she was working with her dissertation advisors, 
in Paris, they had to communicate, right? So going to Paris and looking in those archives for communications that, that should be there. Um, and so that's been part of this project is looking, you know, not, not knowing if they're there. You know, usually when you get money, they want to know that you're going to look at something, <laughs> not going to look at something that may or may not exist. But that's been a lot of this work has been trying to find um, places where, where there are traces of her and where she should be. Um, so there's a lot more work to be done. And, and just to mention, to go back on the scrapbook piece um, and why people create and, and looking at um, just a broader range of modes of expression and communication and um, community-based work, I, th I think about, too, expanding beyond just scrapbooks, you know. And scrapbooks are one, scrapbooks, you know, can be one artifact and one record of what people felt or thought was important or how they chose to document their lives or the lives of their communities. Um, but there are, you know, there are recipe books. There are, um, you know, different forms of interculture. culture. There's dress. There's, there's so many different modes through which, um, you know, black women expressed and communicated um, their daily, you know, everyday lives and experiences. And I think it's really up to us to broaden um, what we think about if we really want to be able to, you know, capture or, you know, incorporate um, the range of voices. Um, I wanted to thank the sister from the Civil, um, the Civil War Museum. Yeah. Um, and I believe the, president, the, the director now is African American woman too, am I right? No, that's a different museum. <laughs> Thank you for centering um, our experiences in a place where they're so often erased, but also, also erased with a kind of force, right, of memory. Um, you're doing frontline work, obviously, <laughs> you know, and um, I just wanted to, to, to thank you for announcing that to the group. Um, and then I, I really want to thank you for your comments about the fact that we are rediscovering that which has already been caretaken, right? That has already been part of a history of um, cultural knowledge and affirmation in our own communities through oral histories and through preservation um, methods. And, and that if we don't acknowledge that, then we come with a colonizationist mindset that also can be fairly individualistic, right? And so I think we, you know, I, I just want to thank you for bringing that back to our attention over and again. And then I want to thank you for your question about I'm going to reinterpret it. What makes um, DA, what makes a black project black, right? Which is the question I heard you say. And how we can use a protocol of accountability, right? Friendly if it needs to, if it can be friendly, not so friendly if it doesn't need to be friendly, so that we can complicate the ontological questions and the colonizationist questions about academic gentrification, right? So, um, and it just seems to me important for us to think about the fact that subject isn't the only thing that makes something black. How many graduate students, right, are involved? The, the, um, one of the things that is beautiful to me about DH is that it, it calls for a collectivity, right? It calls for a group of people to function together. And that's why we call everybody's name, right, when we're talking, when, as, as, a, as a, because we need to, model that, met as, that as a methodology, right? And by going back to one person, the head, right, and knowing the head and talking about the, how the head person of a digital project, right, is doing amazing work, we're erasing the collectivity and the politics of that collectivity, right? Who's getting trained? Who's getting opportunities, right? How many graduate students are involved? How many IT, what is, what are the, po the empowerment politics, right? of the ways in which we think about the collectives that are working together to produce this kind of history. And then how do we make that public, right? If this is public, if, this is, if these are public projects, why is it only the end that gets public, the public facing part that gets public? We need to make the processes public and then we can talk about the politics of accountability, right, around that very, right, politics. So we wanna know, does your team have graduate students on it? Does your team have undergraduate students on it? Are they getting paid, right? Like, who are they? I am not scared of a, of a box on a spreadsheet that says black, right? That says people of color, right? I wanna know that, I want, and if this is a queer project, we should know who's queer, 
right, you know? And not to out anybody, but to make sure that people are involved in their own history, right, you know? I mean, I know this, and I am black and Jewish, let me just say it here, that when Jew, if Jews had a group of folks who were producing their history and they weren't Jewish, can I get an amen? <laughs> this would not go down, all right? It would not go down. All right, and I, will, and I will use that example over and over again because it is one that resonates with white folks as, 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 uh, as um, viable, as acceptable, right? And so it should be acceptable to us to say that it is not okay to produce history that is a gentrified history, right? You cannot move into our neighborhoods, right, and not include us. We need some community-based agreements. Right, some CBAs in our own academic work. It's not just you it's not just inclusion writers, right? Which goes to a very different model. It is about community-based agreements, right? That that protects the academic and intellectual and scholarly community that has been doing this work for decades, right? That cannot be moved out of the way at this moment, right? That was preserved for decades through people's labor that cannot be moved away at this moment. So we're producing spreadsheets at this point. We're in the moment of trying to do that that says, right, how many people are involved? Um, who's at the head? Is it the subject that is black? Is it the leadership, right? And this is not about a kind of um, quantifiable purity. It's about producing ethical production of distributed labor that is about training up a next generation that does not produce the photograph that you put online that went viral of 30 white men saying they're doing public history and applied history, right? There is a process to avoiding that production, right? And that process includes saying our names, right? And that has to be done. And we need to not be fearful of it because there is always a place for scholars who are about the work, no matter their race, no matter their gender, no matter their sexual, you about the work, right? You are welcome. Black folks have been real good at that, yeah. all right? I just want to add at the end, though, when we think of archives and material, et cetera, the one reality everybody's tipping around is deaccessioning, yeah. that you have archives that had lots of material, and you have archivists that decide what's important and what's, and what's not. not. So when you say you're going to Paris to look, you have to understand there could have been or not been the sensitivity that these were letters from this African-American woman, not important pile, yeah. as opposed yeah. to the important pile. So I think that when you go to an archive looking, it, you have to be aware of the politics and the procedures for deciding what will remain and what, and what can go away. It can be deaccessioned. It's yeah. not important. And so I think that that is a part of when you're saying when you go looking, if you're looking in institutions, you have to understand the institutional realities mm -hmm. as opposed to many, many community-based institutions that don't have the same they have different kinds of issues. But I, I, I would like to at least add that when you say go looking, you should be aware that when you're looking, you are dependent on the archivist's decision about what will be deaccessioned. And that's a reality. And Thank this you. is why it is so important that scholars don't just think about becoming academics, yes. right? That we also talk about becoming archivists, right? And people who make decisions in cultural institutions. Because without that kind of, right, so ways in which we can preserve our own history, it just won't happen. So with that, I think we're going to conclude. I want to thank everyone. I want to take a moment. Take a moment. <laughs> we have to do, I want to just do a, a brief close and then Dr. Matthews has something to say. And as I said, we want to invite you all to join us for, for our reception across uh, the, the hallway um, at the museum. But I definitely want to do a special thanks to um, Penn State University. <laughs> the Eberly Family Special Collections Library at Penn State. Howard University Libraries, the Moreland Spingarn Research Center, and a particular shout out to Ms. Joellen El Bashir, who was not here but always holding down the fort for us. Um, our panelists. 
um, also Mr. Errol Watkins in the back for making this all physically possible and all the staff, interns, and faculty who contributed to the project as a whole and to the event. Thank you so much. My name is Adrena Eiffel and I have spent the last 15 years working in cultural projects. I consider archivists, librarians, historians, and academics some of my closest and dearest <laughs> friends. <laughs> and I really enjoy working then and I, I really thank you all for being in my living room because this, this is part of my dream to have these conversations every week. And with that, I will give it over to another friend, colleague, Dr. Matthews. So I just wanted to share with you all, I just, I have the access to the data as we talk about the data. And one of the great things about this project is being able to share this history with people around the world. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to share with you the top 10 countries that, look at, that are looking at the Anna Julia Cooper oh, collection. Right. And so of course the United States is number one. The second is France, Brazil, the United Kingdom, Slovakia. Canada, India, Haiti, Indonesia, and Australia. So those are the top 10 places interested in the history of Anna Julia Cooper. And I thought Slovakia was most interesting because I'm like, I'm <laughs> And uh, the top institution is the University of Edinburgh in the United Kingdom. So I wonder what they're looking at and what they're up to. So just, it's just one of the most exciting things to be able to digitize this these collections and share them with the world and have people from everywhere being able to have access to them. Because that's what it's all about, providing access. So thank you all for coming. Enjoy the reception.